Hey guys and welcome to the 1% body video. What I want to talk about today is how we are going to helpfully get all of you to a 1% body and what it means to get into the top 1% of the fittest and healthiest people in the UK. So when we talk about a 1% body within our challenge, we're trying to get everyone as healthy and as fit as possible. And now what does that look like with our body tracks metrics? So for most people, you've done a lot of your body tracks at the moment and a lot of you have seen where you come on this little sheet of paper. So for instance, depending on your age, you'll see where, where you should be to get in the top 1%. It can give you an, somewhere that you can aim for in the future if you're not quite there, or if you are there, somewhere to maintain. So for most people, we're trying to aim to maintain about 18 to 24 um, on a BMI scale. This is the height to weight ratio. This is considered generally a good indicator of your weight isn't too high or too low. You're kind of in that medium range. For body fat, though, for men and women, women we differ uh, quite substantially. So for men, we're looking for 6 to 12% regardless of age. Uh, and that's to get in the top 1%. And for women, we're looking for 17 to 22% regardless of age. So kind of in those brackets. So even if you're in your 60s, we're aiming for around 22% as though to be in the top 1%. And for men, we're aiming for about 12% if you want to be in the top 1%. Now, again, for most of those, you don't always have to be in the top 1% if you don't want to, but aiming for around that is a good overall goal. For most, uh, for most females as well, for muscle mass, we're aiming for around 78 to 84%. And for most males, we're aiming for around 83 to 89%. Now, you may be thinking, Ben, I don't, I'm quite happy as I am. Why do I really need to get my body fat down to this level? Or why do I need to get my muscle mass percentage up to that level? Well, part of the reason we're doing this is not only just to kind of look good and feel good and perform differently, but we also want to live a long and healthy life. Some of you uh, have been around the past when we've talked about, we've talked about longevity and we've talked about health span and lifespan. One of the big things, uh, factors that really affects people's lifespan, so the actual length of their life and their active health span, their years, their active years that they can actively do things by themselves, is their body fat and muscle mass percentage. They found in, in predominantly most studies and a lot of meta-analysis where they looked at multiple studies that people who had the better grip strength, people who had better strength to weight uh, ratios in regards to their body, so a lot of the tests that we have done, the grip strength for body weight, the squat, the deadlift, those types of things. People that had stronger bodies, they tended to live longer and had longer lifespans where they not only lived longer, but they actually had healthy lifespans where they could stay more mobile. They could be self-sufficient into their 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. So whereas some, someone that doesn't have a very high muscle mass, for instance, may need assisted care or may have more issues because muscle mass is an incredible benefit to the body. It has so many benefits, I'll do a separate video talking about that, but it's hugely beneficial to the body. Same with body fat, not having too much body fat or too low body fat is crucial. We want to be in this kind of optimal area. If we have too much body fat for a long period of time, it can start to uh, create a lot of toxicity in the body and have a lot of uh, detrimental effects to the body. So what we don't want to do is obviously have too, too much or too little and same with muscle mass, we want to ideally have a nice and high amount. One of the other things that we tested were obviously was visceral fat. So one to three is considered really optimal for visceral fat for most people regardless of age, even if you're in your 60s, trying to maintain around a 3% visceral fat is really, really good. And a metabolic age, 15 to 20 years younger than yourself, that is considered the top 1%. Now, all of these metrics here give us a better kind of idea of what we're going to be like in the future because if you have if you're in the top one percent now then you're probably going to be very healthy in the future if you're in the bottom one percent or the bottom 20 percent or bottom 30 percent then you are probably going to have a lot of issues as you get older there's a link that i or a picture that i will show you guys that basically talks about vo2 max and why it's so important and that's why one of the reasons why we tested it in regards to lifespan there was a huge study done that looked at People that had the lowest VO2 max that were in the bottom 25% died on average 10 years earlier than the people in the top 10%. So 10 years is a huge amount of time. And uh, obviously for most of us, we want to live longer and healthier lives. So who wouldn't want an extra 10 years um, whilst maintaining a high, visceral, uh, a high um, VO2 max? 
So one of the reasons why we're testing you now is because VO2 max tends to decrease with age unless you're actively improving it or actively doing things that can encourage it to improve. So one of the things that I suggest to a lot of people is testing these things on a regular basis so therefore they can be indicators how you're going to be in the future. So for instance, if my VO2 max is gradually decreasing, I'm going to do a lot more of that exercise to hopefully bump it back up and keep it and maintain it at a good level as long as I can. Often our sports performance decreases in the late 50s. Um, for men, uh, we can maintain our strength a little bit longer, but for a lot of women in their late 30s to 40s, strength starts to decrease unless you're actively strength training. And it's a real important one because if you want to have strong bones, if you want to have an active lifestyle as you get older and be fit and healthy, uh, less chronic diseases, then these are super important to get in the optimal levels. Doesn't always have to be in the 1%, but that's what we're generally aiming for. So, how can we get a 1% body? Well, all of you guys are going to be exercising regularly, and we're going to be doing strength training, we're going to be doing cardiovascular training, interval training, lots of different challenges to keep the training um, interesting. But another really important thing is nutrition. Now, when we look at nutrition, there's so many what we call tribals, uh, tribalistic views or tribes of people. So some people subscribe to a certain way of eating, some people subscribe to a certain way of living. They call these tribes because often people get into a group and it's really hard to get out and they kind of identify, yep, yeah, I like that way and that's the way for me. What I would say is if your body fat, muscle mass, visceral fat, metabolic age isn't quite where you want it to be or not in the top 1% or top 10%, then maybe there's something that you're doing that doesn't quite suit you. Maybe there's something that you're doing that you, you either don't know how to change or it isn't quite right. Maybe your diet and lifestyle isn't suiting your health. Often a lot of times people have a bias towards the way that they eat and the way they exercise because like all of us we have a bias to the way that we live. We might live and enjoy a couple of beers on the weekends and we think that's valuable for us. But to someone else that might be the worst thing that they can do. So we've kind of become these tribalistic uh, viewpoints where we become very biased to our viewpoints because that's how we want to live our lives. Whereas our bodies, the physiology doesn't change. The physiology actually tells us is this person doing really well? Have they got high body fat and high visceral fat? Well, that person's lifestyle and uh, nutrition probably isn't optimal. So what we're going to try and do is give you guys the keys to create an optimal diet that works around with your life, but based on a couple of key factors. So in any kind of diet, and anyone that wants to lose body fat, but anyone that wants to maintain muscle mass, you need these, main, these three main things. So we've got fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. These are called your macros. So macros are like the big three, and you can break them down even further, but for, for this video we won't. You need all three for a healthy body, but depending on the ratio, some people split them 30% fats, 30% carbs, or generally more carbohydrates, but often it's 30% fats, 30% protein, and then 60%, uh, sorry, uh, about 40% carbs. Now, if you're doing that split, that's totally fine. You can change those percentages. So you can increase carbohydrates when maybe when you're doing lots of exercise. Maybe if you're trying to decrease body fat, you can decrease carbohydrates. If you're trying to increase muscle mass, you might increase protein, decrease fats and carbs. There's lots of ways that you can play around with this. And this is uh, for those that have been around the block with different diets. You may have seen things like keto diet, paleo diet, a plant-based diet, a blue zone diet, fasting, intermittent fasting, uh, pescatarian, vegetarian, high carb diets, and also um, smoothies. These are all ways that people can lose weight and can lose body fat, generally because of three major things. Any one of these could be really beneficial and you may, might feel better on them, but they all have three main things in common. They're generally all lower in calories. So for instance, when you go on a keto or a paleo diet, these are considered uh, low carbohydrate diets. Often you're decreasing your carbohydrates, but also your diet will be void of highly processed foods, sugar. So you're cutting out a lot of carbohydrates. When you do that, you're decreasing your calories, so you're lower in overall calories. You're also less processed foods. When you have less processed foods, often people sleep better. Same with a plant-based diet or a blue zone diet. It's very high in uh, plant, uh, plant foods. So things like beans, lentils, fruits and veggies. Again, void of a lot of highly processed foods. So very low calorie foods. Often people lose weight. They start feeling better. And all these, things these three things happen.
Same with intermittent fasting, people are cutting out a whole meal. So again, they're low in lower calories, less processed food, and they generally sleep better. A lot of these diets, they have similar principles if you are to follow them for a long period of time. Most people can see some kind of weight loss or fat loss. But what we're trying to do long term is create a diet and plan that work for you that you can sustain for a long period of time. It can be a work in progress, a uh, pro process that I'm myself trying to work on constantly. So every week I try and maybe change something or every couple of months I try and add in things, take away stuff, learn new things that I should be adding into my diet. Often it could be, for instance, this week I'm adding something else into the teas that I drink. Uh, it could be something else that I'm trying to include in my diet and gradually, slowly my diet becomes uh, kind of exposed over a number of years that this is the way that I eat and this really works for me and I feel better on this way of, of dieting and this way of eating than I do just following a strict set of rules. So one thing that could be really beneficial for you guys is looking at your own diet and then start to look at where can you lower the calories if you want to lose body fat. If you're not quite in these optimal levels, where can you lower the calories? Could it be things like uh, chocolate bars? I know uh, some of you enjoy chocolate bars, but little snacks. Things that aren't going to be optimal for these goals here. Decreasing things like alcohol can be really beneficial. I know a lot of people that have decreased their alcohol have really dropped body fat. Decreasing sugar consumption is a massive one. For a lot of people, they reach when they get tired, they reach for like a sugary snack, whatever it may be. It could be a donut, it could be something from the bakery, something that's going to be sugary, taste nice. Often when people decrease their sugar intake, their body fat starts to really drop and their muscle mass starts to pick up because generally as we decrease our sugar, we might be replacing it with one of these three ones up the top. One thing that I would recommend to most people is that Making little changes can be phenomenal to your overall health, but do take it slow and steady. Sometimes if you're gonna change your diet overnight, it's, it's really difficult to maintain long-term, and we're trying to create long-term progress here. So the 100 days are designed for you guys to really iron out your own diet, find out what works for you, but also see what works for you in regards to your body fat and your athletic performance. So if you're going on the body tracks weekly and you're seeing some good performance, and you're like, yep, my diet's working, and then you change something and it doesn't seem to work very well, perfect, you can always switch back and then you can see which diet is helping you to achieve your goals. If your diet isn't serving you, then it's not ser if it's not serving you to allow you to get towards these better body fats and muscle mass ratios, then it's really not serving you. And especially with energy levels, a lot of people struggle with energy, uh, they feel like maybe their hormones are off, this can often be due to deficiencies in diet or it can be uh, overconsumption of certain types of foods, often highly processed or highly manufactured foods. And in the UK, a lot of our diet now is becoming ultra processed. And that term is around in the media, it's everywhere online. Decreasing your ultra processed foods are going to be probably for most people, I would say 80% of the way there. If you can decrease your ultra processed foods and go back to traditional foods that are around, let's say, 100 years ago, um, then you'll probably have much better success. Things that are like whole foods, things like if you eat a potato, the potato doesn't have 25 ingredients in. If, you eat, uh, if you're eating a chicken breast, it doesn't have 35 different ingredients in. But if you're eating a penguin bar, for instance, that might have 25 different ingredients in. If you're having a can of, for instance, Monster, if you look on the back and see all the ingredients in there, it's not just water, it's not just uh, something simple with like a water with lemon, there's 25 different ingredients in there. Often a lot of those ingredients can play havoc on things like hormones and can um, create issues with the endocrine system and uh, especially for those that are trying to change their composition, it is really important to kind of get back to a simpler way of eating. Our physiology, as we kind of talked about the other day, from the 1960s, as a, as a UK, as a population, has drastically changed. But it's predominantly through our nutrition. There's no evolution happening to the UK population. So what we want to try and do is get back to us the kind of principles of good, healthy eating, and then our body will just adapt over time. The other things that we can start to do as well is, regardless of your the way that you want to eat, we, we can look at total calories. Now, when we look at total calories, that's an input and an output. So your input is what you're putting into your body, the output is what you're burning. Now every day all of us have a BMR, basal metabolic rate. That's the amount of calories that we're going to burn just sitting on the sofa moving around day to day. Now 
as we start to exercise or do more, uh, do more walking, do more activity, maybe we're doing some gardening, we're going to increase the amount of calories that we burn or our output. For those that are strength training often, um, you're going to build bigger muscles and bigger muscles require more calories to sustain themselves. So you're going to require more calories, therefore those muscles are going to burn more calories, therefore your output just sitting on the sofa gets bigger. One of the best things that you can do to increase your output is either exercise more, but the other one is decrease your input. So as you decrease your input and increase your output, you have a higher calorie deficit because the the amount of calories that you're putting in is less, the amount of calories going out is more, therefore you often find people start to lose weight and they start to feel better. Now, if you're, for instance, a male and you're in your 20% body fats, dropping even just 5% increases your uh, lifespan potential by up to 5 to 10 years. That's for most people. Now, if you're in the morbidly obese category, there's a high risk that you would be, there's a high risk of death even that year. So for, regardless of age, if you're in the morbidly obese category, which for men is above 30% and for women is above 35%, then there's a very high risk that you will have some kind of issue this year. One of the main things that we want to get you guys to do is decrease that body fat as fast as possible, but as safely as possible. So some of the ways that you can do that are lowering your overall calories, less overall processed food, and sleeping better. Now, it doesn't matter, like we said, in regards to what way of eating that you would like to follow, but there's some things that we definitely need. So for instance, our body needs our fats, carbs, and proteins. So you want a diet that's got a good variety of all of those. You also want a diet that's high in micronutrients. Micronutrients are the vitamins and the minerals, and we also, high vitamins and high minerals, uh, stop us getting deficiencies, and deficiencies can generally lead to long-term health issues or chronic diseases. So when we stop a lot of our deficiencies, we are generally much healthier human beings. Our functionality of our cells and our body, they can function much better. So vitamins and minerals we generally get from food. They're not just supplements that you can take. Supplements are often a quick fix, but they're not often absorbed as well as real food. So one thing that I would say is getting a diet that's high in vitamins and minerals is really good. Where are most vitamins and minerals? Well, they're in predominantly fruits and veggies. You can obviously get a lot in things like legumes and nuts and seeds as well. Especially on a plant-based diet, you can get a lot of uh, fats in um, protein in nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, that kind of stuff. But eating a lot of variety of a lot of different colors of fruits and vegetables. The other thing that often a lot of people don't think about is they think about these top three, but we're not thinking about fiber. And I know I've spoken to a lot of you in the past about fiber. Now, one thing I would definitely recommend is I've been looking a lot in the fiber over the last into fiber over the last probably eight months. And fiber seems to be such a crucial role when it comes to your gut, um, gut health, and also your immune system health. One of the things that uh, I found for myself is increasing fiber from, let's say, if you're around 25 grams, whereas the average person in the UK is under 25 grams, the recommended amount is about 25 grams per day. That's just to meet your, the um, not to get ill. Optimal levels are close towards 60 to 100 grams of fiber. Now, I'm not suggesting you eat 100 grams or 60 grams straight away. With fiber, you want to increase about 5 grams every two weeks or so. So very small amounts in incrementally increased. But for a lot of people, when they increase fiber, not only um, do they feel better, they feel more energetic. If they start to experience things like bloating and stuff like that, uh, often that decreases as you continue that high fiber diet for a longer period of time. Your gut bacteria gets used to breaking it down and those uh, prebiotics and probiotics are fantastic for making short chain fatty acids in the body which are really essential for brain health and overall functionality of the gut. So things that you can do that are high fiber, any foods that are high fiber, predominantly most vegetables and plants are high fiber, fermented foods and are prebiotic and probiotic. So anything that's fermented, kimchi, sauerkraut, are great to add into foods. And it's actually recommended now that most people have a serving of fermented foods at least once a day. So in the most up-to-date uh, nutritional pyramids and recommendations from the government, it's recommended that you, everyone eat a small serving of fermented foods for gut bacteria. Now, what we're, what we're going to look at is hopefully a few things that you can incorporate into your daily life and a few things that you can include and kind of get rid of out of your diet. So most of these successful diets that help people lose weight, they have a few, uh, few things. Most of these diets avoid things like snacks. So things like crisps that aren't going to be high in protein. 
they're going to be high in um, highly processed fats and they've got carbohydrates but those carbohydrates are highly processed so they're going to be generally lower in protein so crisp might not be such an optimal goal for a snack let's say 100 calories 200 calories whatever it may be whereas an apple might be a great option 100 calories to 50 calories high in fiber and you could for instance get some peanuts or some nuts apple in peanut this kind of fat that is more optimal and the body can absorb it a lot better that rather than the highly manufactured oils that you might get in crisps the body can absorb much more but also you're getting more energy from that and also you're filling up your stomach a lot more so decreasing the amount of snacks that you have and increasing the amount of volume of food that you have decreasing processed food like we said trying to limit your the amount of food that you're having that's got multiple ingredients in so buying it something that's packaged that has 15 or 16 different ingredients added to it made by someone else if you can buy foods that you can grow in the ground or foods that you can buy at the supermarket that's very simple you're not going to buy like a chicken breast and it's going to have 16 different things in it. it's just going to be a chicken breast so for a lot of you trying to eat as simple as possible is going to be really good Decreasing your, your alcohol content is going to be ideal because alcohol is just carbohydrates or empty calories often. So those empty calories generally have lower protein, not going to be optimal for your body fat or muscle mass. So decreasing your alcohol content can really help as well. High calorie drinks, things like energy drinks, if you're having, let's say, Starbucks or coffee that have like creams in and other stuff in, often can be 200 to 400 calories for a drink. Those liquid calories can go down so easily but it doesn't really help us with the satiation, so feeling fuller for longer. So decreasing your high calorie drinks, opting for things that are going to be very low calorie, uh, anything that can be as close to water as possible. I know some people don't like to drink water, but if you do like water, having water on its own or adding other things into water can be really beneficial just to make it taste a little bit nicer, but keeping those calories a little bit lower. Decreasing things like saturates and high amounts of um, table salt, that kind of stuff can be really beneficial and decreasing the amount of highly processed oils, sugar, and other ingredients in food. There are some benefits to some oils, but from most of the research out there, it is only a couple of oils that are very beneficial. Things like hemp oil, avocado oil, and the um, olive oil, but it has to be generally um, a extra virgin olive oil in a glass, or brown glass, or a dark glass, and it has to be ideally organic. Those are considered really optimal for your health. And olive oil can actually decrease the blood glucose spike that you get from food by about up to 30 to 40%. So adding cold olive oil, not cooking in olive oil, but adding a cold shot of olive oil or putting drizzling on a salad, like in the Mediterranean style, they often don't cook with olive oil, they drizzle it on salads and they have it cold. It can blunt the spike of sugar that we get when we eat food. So if you're trying to if you have diabetic, if you're a diabetic or you're on the diabetes uh, spectrum, this can be really beneficial uh, to know. Some things to include would be things like high fiber, a more variety of plants. So if you're trying to eat different types of plants. For those that really want to challenge, it's actually recommended that you eat 30 different types of plants per week. So if you count up the different species and variety of plants, see if you can hit to 30 different types of plants per week. Often a lot of us, we have certain plants that we might eat, it might be broccoli, you might have certain foods that you eat often, it might be peas, carrots, whatever, but you have that again and again and again. We're not getting too much variety. So try and eat a variety of plants and same with fruits, try and eat a good variety of fruits, not uh, like 10 bananas isn't going to be as optimal as one banana, some blueberries, raspberries, strawberries and all that variety that comes with it. Increasing veggies. Um, Optimal carbs, again, if you're trying to eat optimal carbs, eating things that are, I would say, a whole food and a plant are going to be great. So if you can eat things like oats, they're generally fantastic for being fuller for longer. Um, all these things come with calories. Things like rice can be beneficial, but don't overdo the rice. Um, compared to a lot of the breads that uh, you might find in the supermarket are going to be more optimal for your health. There's some things that some people might be interested in, things like... Um, uh, sourdough breads are considered better for your gut and digestion and our body actually absorbs less of the calories from things like sourdough, gut, uh, sourdough breads and as well as things like sprouted breads. So things like Ezekiel bread uh, is really digestible 
and uh, our gut loves uh, anything that is uh, sprouted and getting it digest that much better. So if you struggle with um, white flour or if you have um, gluten intolerant, intolerance, these types of things might be a better option for your gut and you might have less um, gut dysbiosis. The other things that I would recommend are things like the proteins and fats, optimizing whatever protein source you want. If you're plant-based or vegan or vegetarian, you can go things like um, nuts, beans, legumes, lentils, um, you can go chickpeas, you can go uh, seitan, tofu, and there's lots of other fake meats out there, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend those types of things because they're, again, highly processed uh, foods. So often trying to stick to those whole foods is going to be a much better and healthier option. Whereas things like fats, you can get really beneficial and healthy fats. So things like avocado uh, fat is, is really optimal for the body. Same like hemp seeds and chia seeds, a lot of seeds and nut fats are fantastic for the body. There's a few things that I know some people struggle with, and this might be, some of you may get this if you're increasing your fiber. It's called gut dysbiosis. Some of you might be experiencing it at the moment. It's basically where you have a certain amount of gut bacteria, um, and you introduce a new food and then your gut bacteria, you don't actually have enough gut bacteria to process that food. So your body basically bloats and, and struggles to digest it. So often this happens when people eat more fiber. That's why the slow, going slow and, um, and eating often, but small amounts and increasing five grams of fiber per every two weeks is a much better option. So if you do have pain when eating high fiber foods, go slow and often or, or regular and often, but adding small amounts in should be better. Or if you are, if there is anything that you really struggle with, you can go on an elimination diet where you void that um, food for let's say seven days and then you add it back in in a very small amount. Often people, that really works with people and they can start digesting that food again. When you are not so regular with the number twos on the, on the toilet, Fiber can really help, but just be wary that you may be going to the toilet more. Often people think this is a little bit worried. They're like, oh, I'm going to the toilet more. If you're eating more fiber, you're going to generally be going, um, clearing out your system a little bit more often, which can be a really good thing. And if you get ill often, um, if you have a compromised immune system, a lot of this comes from the gut. So for those of you that remember, a couple of years ago, we did um, a little bit in my house talking about nutrition. Often people get ill when they have a gut dysbiosis. So gut dysbiosis basically means that their gut is not functioning correctly. And I think it's something about 92% of your immune system is in the gut. And if you have a poor gut, uh, poor gut bacteria, a variety of good healthy gut bacteria, then you're probably gonna have a, a rubbish immune system. You're gonna get ill often. So improving your gut generally improves people's immune systems, improves their T scores, so their, their killer T, uh, T cell, um, scores which are fantastic for going around the body and killing any pathogens, any viruses, bacteria uh, and things like cancers as well. So it can be really beneficial to up your, your killer T cell levels uh, and just improve your overall immune system. So there's a lot there to kind of take in but a few takeaways from this is have a little look at this and think right how much body fat do I want to lose or can I lose or if you're aiming for the top 1% how much body fat do I need to lose. For a lot of you you can definitely achieve your, your goals in the next 100 days. 100 days is a huge amount of time to work on a long-term goal like this. I've had people in the past that are really focused that have dropped huge amounts of body fat in 60 to 100 days. And it just takes that dedication and that kind of hard work and the consistency of that hard work done daily to really get those fantastic results. So if you're, let's say, currently at... 30% body fat and you're a male and you're in that kind of obese category, it's very possible that you can get into the 15% or lower category in the next 100 days. It just depends on the amount of exercise, your consistency with nutrition and exercise, as well as the other things that you're doing uh, in your life. So if you're not going out partying, eating cakes, um, huge amounts of calories on the weekend, this kind of stuff, it really does make a huge difference to how you're going to be just before Christmas this year. So if you've made it this far through the video, guys, you've done bloody well. Um, if you have any questions, send me a message and uh, looking forward to seeing you all very soon.